afternoon, everybody. I'm thrilled to be here. My name is Eric Palmer. Um, I am our moderator for today. Um, and I don't think that means there's a whole lot for me to do, but one of the things I need to do is report that, unfortunately, our colleague Mary Erickson is not going to be able to present in this session today. Um, but we have um, three other spectacular pres presenters here. Um, the first of which is um, John Christian Amar, or is it Amar John Christian? Okay, it's, it's Amar from, from the University of Pennsylvania, and let it rip. Thank you. Hello everyone, how you doing? Um, I did the wrong thing and packed too much information to this, in this, so I'm gonna start right away. Um, so obviously a lot of people here in this room know about television and distribution, you wouldn't be here if you didn't. Um, and, you know, if we're gonna kind of do a real abstract view of television history, you can say that there's probably two dilemmas. Um, there's an historical distribution dilemma of not enough space um, for producers, right, three networks, four networks, um, before 1980, and the current distribution dilemma, which is the exact opposite, simply too much. Um, hundreds of networks, and I think online, um, that long tail is simply extended. There are simply more TV-style networks online. Um, and so we have all this space for producers now, and my question is, can digital distribution, uh, specifically internet distribution, uh, monetize the long tail for a broader base of producers in the industry? So before I get into the case study that I want to use to show whether that's possible, which is Strike TV, I first want to give you a brief um, overview of the kind of robust web video landscape, of which, um, which is quite, quite exciting. Uh, the ones that get the most attention are curated sites, meaning the programs are selected for the network, um, produced by people in Hollywood, some of them you know and some of them you don't. Um, the most prominent of this is Netflix, obviously investing um, hundreds of millions of dollars eventually in creating original content, but there's also AOL and Yahoo and Crackle, um, Hulu, there's a lot of companies right now that have cash to spend on original content and they're doing it. Um, so that's the kind of large example there. But in the mid-size, there's also uh, a number of networks that are doing really interesting things. Um, one of those is My Damn Channel, a kind of offbeat comedy site, doing a lot of branded entertainment um, with people like David Wayne. You might know them from their early hit, uh, You Suck at Photoshop, from like 2007 or whatever. And then Strike TV is kind of the small scale example of that type of site. Um, there are also Anyone Can Upload sites. Clearly here, YouTube is the big example, also spending upwards of $100 million on creating original content, mostly working with the mainstream media, but also working with their kind of homegrown, independent talent, the people who five years ago might have been called amateurs, but really are no longer. Um, the mid-sized companies here, companies like Bunny or Die, um, which initially allowed everyone to upload, and they still do, but really are becoming a kind of film studio, and they have a movie in theaters right now, Tim Merrick's Billion Dollar Movie. Yeah. I haven't seen it as a good um, uh, Blip is a kind of smaller example of this. It's worth, you know, in the low millions of dollars. And Blip is a site where creators can upload their videos, and they tend to be what people would call skilled producers. It's TV-style web series, um, trying to pose another kind of answer to YouTube, saying that YouTube's for kind of scrappy talent, and we're for the people who know what they're doing. Um, they're having some success doing that. They've raised a lot of venture capital, so they might be around for a while. Finally, there are um, a number of networks targeting minority audiences. A lot of these haven't been getting attention, um, but the ones that have um, are networks like BET Online, which is actually distributing a bunch of original web series on its site, um, and as at least proposing to move those on air, one of which it has said it will, a show called Eight Days a Week. Um, a bunch of other TV networks online are trying to do this. I know Logo has had some interest in web series, although they haven't quite um, made it there yet. There are some mid-sized minority networks. Madame Noir is a really good example of this. It's a kind of news and entertainment site for black women, and they recently moved into video with a couple of unscripted um, web series, uh, one starring a former star, Crush Prince of Bel Air, actually, kind of mommy advice show. And then there's a you know a kind of longer tail of really small, scrappy sites trying to harness all this original production online. Um, ICGayPeople.tv was one that was emailed to me last week. It started this year, and it's trying to create a site where people looking for gay web series um, can go. But there are so many of them. There's Digital Chick TV for women. There's a bunch of them for black people, black LGBT people. There's like three for black women. 
um, Latinos, etc. All of them trying to create TV for minority audiences in reaction to um, the kind of scarcity on air. Um, so you can see there's really a robust marketplace, and this is kind of the tip of the iceberg. And in this marketplace, the large di distributors on your left-hand side are doing quite well. They're working with Hollywood, um, they're selling ads, the CPMs are rising, and they're benefiting from transmedia, iPads, that sort of thing. The mid-sized ones in the middle are also doing pretty well, not as well, but they're finding their, their niches, um, they're soliciting idea, ideas from brands, um, employing low-cost independent production companies, um, that are hungry for work and really eager to get their work seen online. Um, My Damn Channel in particular is going to announce later this month that they're launching a live network with YouTube. So they're starting to scale up. Lyft just raised $12 million. And the smaller producers on the right-hand side are more of a mixed bag. Um, there's tons of content from them to choose from. Um, because television has been sort of democratized, at least in short form, um, a lot of people are creating independent web series without a place to distribute them. So they can really um, just kind of scrape from YouTube and have a slate of 30 shows in a week in a week if they want to. A lot of that's enabled by non-exclusive licensing and all that stuff. But they're really starved for inve investment and audiences are largely unaware of um, these kinds of sites. So for me, that's that the right side of the screen, the smaller side, is where we might see the broad um, base of producers that we're looking for um, online. Um, because sites like Netflix are really working with David Fincher, they're not going to work with um, you know, the 4,000 production companies that are in Los Angeles. And Strike TV, I think, is an interesting, historically significant case to look at whether smaller independent sites can actually distribute and make money um, off this kind of content. Um, so Strike TV, and while I talk, I'm just going to show one of their marquee series from last week, um, last year, excuse me, a show called Dwelling, just to give you a sense of what you might see if you want on the site. Um, Strike TV is representative of grassroots distribution by Hollywood, kind of insider outsiders, depending on how you categorize it. And as you can see from the motto, Hollywood Unplugged, they're really p pitching themselves as a kind of response to Hollywood, um, a direct response to Hollywood, which is based on their roots, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, it was started by uh, strikers in, as a result of the Writers Guild of America strike, 2007 to 2008, and it was an effort to create a, a true new media institution, an online TV network um, for creators, by creators, um, a way to kind of get um, their work off YouTube and onto a, a separate space that's curated and monetizable. Um, remember, this was 2008, which was started where it's a different moment than we are right now. And I'm trying to understand what, kind of, what these kind of efforts mean for um, the possibilities of the media. Um, and so, you know, just to give you a sense of what this might mean, Dwelling is a show by Anthony Q. Farrell. He's one of the writers, or he was a writer for The Office. I'm not sure if he's still on the show. Um, you know, he's a black creator, he's a black showrunner online. On television, there aren't that many black showrunners, but in this space, right, he has the opportunity to make his own show, if you will. So that's the kind of ideal. And Strike TV is really a story about ideals. Um, it was an outgrowth of, as I said, the 2007 to 2008 Writers Guild of America strike. And in understanding the roots of the strike, I think we can understand why these networks are maybe historically. Um, the strike was a result of a long brewing, really years long debate over online residuals. And I, it's Patrick here. I'm sure you could give more context about this in the comments. But nevertheless, residuals are a really important part of being a member of the Writers Guild. It's a really important victory that they won in the 1960s. Um, but it's been increasingly difficult, I think, for the writers to get money from corporations because the conglomerates are all kind of coalesced. Right? So they um, sort of reacted and they struck in 2007. If you want to read more about the concepts of this, like Miranda Banks' work is really great um, on this. Strike TV comes in in early 2008. Um, weeks into the strike, um, the blog United Hollywood posted a notice about the workshop um, for Hollywood productions interested in bypassing the AMPTP, which is you know, the body that represents Hollywood in this case. The blog said, the AMPTP would like us to sit around and wait for them. Well, we're tired of waiting. It's time to start doing. And so in this moment, um, you know, a lot of a lot of people, not only writers, but also directors and Hollywood workers, because remember Hollywood's at a standstill at this moment, gathered in this room and started to talk about ways to utilize the media as a space for um, kind of creative production. And when I talked to the CEO of Strike TV, Peter Gucci, he estimates that um, 200 series went into production as a result of this meeting. I think that's probably highly inflated. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, a number of series actually did materialize from this moment. Um, most of them didn't last very long at all. Um, one of them that you might know is Dr. Horrible's Long Blog. Another panel also mentioned this as well. Probably the most successful um, 
franchise out of this movement. But the idea was to um, go around Hollywood and use new media as a place to deliver producer-driven content that was creative um, and that was free from kind of the constraints of traditional television. And so some of the ideals that I think we can see through Strike TV. Um, Strike TV was founded on, I would say, two competing ideals. Um, one was the promise of the internet to curate independent storytelling, and the other was for making money outside of corporations. Right? And distribution is about curation and marketing. Uh, select the programs you want to show, and you find the audience that's going to want to do it. It was aiming for a missing middle, a middle that actually kind of exists today, but at the time really didn't exist. Um, there, were, there was the idea that you could make art and create an industry, and also break the hold of, an, of the networks on digital entertainment. Remember Hulu premiered in 2007, earlier in 2007. Um, but not lose your work, they didn't want to lose their work to the sea of content on YouTube, which at the time was heavily um, focused on amateur content, not so much anymore, obviously. And so why would you create a network? What, what does a network do? Um, networks create consistency and quality for advertisers, and with advertisers you have funding, and with money you have a marketplace. Um, so networks like Strike TV are really critical to creating online marketplaces that are more robust and diverse and that sort of thing. So how does Strike TV, or how did Strike TV, propose to operate differently from a traditional network? Um, Peter Gucci says that as a studio, as a new media executive, his role was different from a studio executive. He saw himself as flexible and non-interfering. His job was more matchmaking and helping rather than sort of shaping and constraining shows to the demands of the market, the presumed market. Um, so an example would be a creator would come to him saying, I have a show that's already filmed, but I need music to it. And Peter Higuchi would refer them to the appropriate composer who would do it at a good rate. Right? The idea is that he helps shows be the best that they can be, um, not most marketable to whomever advertiser or presumed audience for that show. He says, I'm more of a facilitator than their overlord. I love the fact that they have total autonomy that they have. I love the fact that they can do whatever they want. So this is highly idealistic, right? This is like the idea that the internet is the space for creativity and freedom. And one of the freedoms that they wanted was freedom from advertisers. At the time, the blog United Hollywood said, shoot first, get advertisers later. This is a good thing. I mean, talent generates the ideas, not marketers. Getting advertisers to finance production can be more hassle than it's worth. And at the time, it was sort of possible to envision a world free of advertiser constraints in production mainly because of ad networks, which automated and still do automate the ad selling process um, based on views and keywords and that sort of thing. Creators could generate money, kind of pennies on the view, um, uh, without having to worry about talking to um, advertisers or having an ad sales team. Um, so this was great, right? There was, there was this moment in which we can envision new kinds of networks supported by creatives. And yet, Strike TV very quickly hit on the realities of the new media marketplace. When I talked to Peter Higuchi in late 2009 and early 2010, after the site had been around for about a year or two, he said that although we have the tools to make this great content and we can distribute this content, there's a little something we forgot about, um, which is marketing. Yes, marketing is important. Uh, so independent distribution is hard, online or off, in any in industry. If you're not supported by conglomerations in this economy, you really have a difficult time. Uh, on online, as I mentioned, there's too much content, which means marketing has more importance than it typically had. Um, and Strike TV simply had no finances, no robust corporate marketing team to find its audiences. It couldn't place ads for its shows on other sites. Um, it did, couldn't pay someone to tweet or use Facebook. They were kind of all on their own. It was Peter and maybe a couple other people, essentially a nonprofit. What's fascinating is that his solution, at least two years ago, which I don't think it, it is anymore, was to um, syndicate Strike TV shows to the affiliate websites of um, conglomerate, so Fox, Los Angeles, NBC, St. Louis, the idea being that those sites um, don't have their own entertainment, and they would actually welcome some entertainment programming to kind of compete with their corporate overlords. Um, that plan fizzled, but what's fascinating for me is that the proposal suggests that new media can't exist on its own, right? It had to go back to more established institutions um, for marketing support. And monetization has also been a huge problem, not only for Strike TV, but really for everyone online, although it's quickly changing. Um, as I mentioned, advertising networks are automated, which means that they're low-rated. Um, because advertisers aren't intimately involved in the placement of, placements of ads, they tend to think that the audiences are not as valuable. Um, so you really do need an ad sales team if you want to be successful in this marketplace. Um, Nielsen is trying to merge web and TV and make that a little bit more seamless, but Nielsen's not talking to independents like Spark TV because those aren't their, their major clients. 
Um, sponsorship and branded entertainment is really the primary way in which independent networks have monetized their content. Um, still, you need a dedicated ad sales team, and also vision is compromised by brand demands. As you mentioned, as I mentioned before, Strike TV was founded on the notion that you could create content without the imposition of corporations. Obviously, that's very difficult to do. Um, sites that have been successful doing this, like MyDan Channel, are essentially you know, commercial studios. They make creative commercials online, really great commercials, but they're basically um, single sponsor and ad placements. Um, other sites that were born out of the strike movement, like anyone but me, that were able to get hundreds of thousands of fans involved, um, have since found out that talking to advertisers, um, they're not very used to dealing with the kind of niche markets online. So anyone but me is a team of lesbian series. And they were told by sponsors that teen lesbians are not a big enough market for them to market to, mm -hmm. despite the fact that there were 500,000 fans for the show. And so just because you're online doesn't mean that the, the rules of the mainstream media have changed. Finally, to conclude, it's a very brisk presentation. Um, what is the promise of web television? There's been a lot of excitement over Netflix and Hulu and YouTube creating original content. But I would argue and question whether this is really a substantial change from the system that we already have. I mean, Netflix is essentially HBO. It's making shows with HBO-style budgets, and in a couple of years, it basically will be HBO. Um, YouTube has some experimental content on site and some indie producers, but by and large, mainly Hollywood, I think, moving into the online space. And so I don't really have a point here. I don't really have a theory, except to suggest that digital distribution really has an unclear politics in this moment. We're probably in a transitional space, um, and we really need to be attentive about all the changes that are happening online um, if we're going to understand what this means holistically. I do have a site that I'm editing called Hack Division that started last month. If you're interested in contributing, it's on the future of television. Mm -hmm. Talk to me afterwards. Okay. Thank you. So our next presenter is Wesley Jones, and he's speaking on behalf of research that he did with Kim Sheehan from the University of Oregon. Um, the title of his presentation is Netflix Became the New Blockbuster and the HBO 2. Hopefully this will work. All right, so I did this with Professor Kim Sheehan. Um, I'm not an academic. I work in um, one of the labor unions in Los Angeles representing TV actors. Um, Kim Sheehan comes from an advertising background, so she really knows TV metrics and how to measure television. So that and the fact that we both love to watch TV um, <laughs> is how we kind of uh, arrived at this topic. So how we approached it, um, this is a whole new area. So we didn't really approach, the, there's not a lot of research done. Um, nobody knows what's going to happen. So we looked at it as sort of a, a SWOT analysis. What's at stake in this experiment? And Netflix is calling it an experiment um, for creative professionals, Netflix themselves, and um, TV viewers. So for those that don't know, this is the deal. Um, it was announced within the last year Netflix outbid AMC and HBO for a series starring Kevin Spacey, directed by David Fincher, um, for House of Cards, which is a political thriller based on a, on a British show that was pretty successful. Um, they made a 26-episode commitment, um, no pilot, so you know, straight to series commitment, which is basically um, sick money. They, they put up a lot of money right away. Um, it's also the first truly original show of its type on this platform. Um, right now, Netflix is airing Lilyhammer, but that's actually, um, that's first domestic airing, that comes from Norway originally. So this is really the first thing that's made, you know, scripted, high quality, you know, Showtime, HBO type TV that's gonna come on the internet first. So, this is, well, let's go back. So, Netflix took this basic, HBO really wanted it, Netflix outbid them. Um, it also kind of hits on this narrative that, that we're going to talk about on this slide. There is this sort of beef between HBO and Netflix that's sort of emblematic of the transition in the media industry overall. And so it's not just this House of Cards thing. I mean, the Time Warner CEO has been, you know, calling Netflix the Albanian army and really hammering on Netflix. <laughs> they, that was a quote. Um, he, uh, 
they, they got the SPAT actually included. They, they um, made them buy the DVDs on the open market instead of the traditional deal of, you know, the wholesale deal that they had for years. So, I mean, there, there really clearly is a Netflix HBO beef. And then this, I, I don't think there should ever be a presentation without some bar charts. Um, <laughs> this shows that comparing the two, even though on, on their face they seem like very different companies, the numbers sort of indicate that they're starting to, to look like similar companies. You see the top is subscribers. So you see HBO sort of plateauing and Netflix is creeping up every year. So they're not that far apart. Bottom is revenue per subscriber. As Netflix, ha Netflix has to invest in original programming, they're starting to see their revenue per subscriber go down slightly. So the metrics for both of these companies, they're starting to sort of look like the same company. And if these trends continue, they could be very similar. So into the analysis, what's at stake for these stakeholders? Netflix, it's going to be hard. This is a television show. It's a serial television show. But there's not going to be Nielsen ratings. They're not going to release ratings information. They don't have advertisers. They don't need to. So how do they quantify success? I mean, you can, you can talk about streaming, but I mean, it's a la carte. I mean, it's not a la carte. It's one price for the whole service. So it's not like you know they're getting additional revenue on it. The numbers get very, very complicated. And this is a lot of what, what Kim talked about in the paper, because she knows this, this Nielsen world very well. And it's a challenge. There's really just no answer, but it's, it, it, so it remains a big unanswered question. Also, original content is crazy expensive. Uh, we've got writers make a lot of money, directors make a lot of money, producers make a lot of money, and Netflix, which was built on just getting a lot of DVDs in the mail, are they going to be able to shoulder the costs of that type, type of production? Then there's also the shelf life concerns. If I can sit down and watch House of Cards in an afternoon, and it costs them $100 million to make, is engaging me for an afternoon worth $100 million? Because normally that show would last a year if it was airing on HBO. So, you know, is the shelf life going to be a problem? Netflix. For creatives, for the writers, directors, actors involved in this, what's at stake? There's no rules with a digital platform like this. Episode length, you don't have to worry about 23 or 43 minutes. You, you, could do, you could do 90 or 120 minutes. Uh, obviously, content's not a concern. It's not really a concern on HBO, but it's definitely not a concern on the internet. Um, maybe, who knows, maybe they'll get fewer network notes from Netflix than they might get from an HBO or a Showtime that's used to making um, you know, six shows a year. And this is, the, this is like my whole, whole work world right there. And so this is a, a huge understatement, that last bullet. All of Hollywood's compensation systems are based on how the work is used. And so, you know, it comes, it comes out of, you know, when, it, when a TV show is rerun or when a movie is shown on a cable system. And, and they're, you know, they're very hard fought, strong, widely accepted standards for this compensation. And this breaks all those rules. So, I mean, and this is a big part of the, why the right strike happened in 2007 and why we're going to probably see more high profile disputes like that going forward. So for TV viewers, for me, I I, choice. The fact that you have this high quality series that you can watch at your leisure for eight bucks a month if you're on the streaming only plan, assuming they don't hike the prices, which they should. Um, <laughs> the, it, you are opening up a world of choice. Cost. If, if the costs are sustainable, you're getting more content at a, at a cheaper price. If they're not, eventually, I mean, we saw the HBO you know, Netflix numbers starting to look similar, are we going to start seeing prices look similar as well? And then also, there's always unintended consequences. If Netflix is able to take HBO out of the premium TV marketplace, is there still going to be as much premium TV? Are they going to really replace all of the high quality shows that HBO and Showtime are making, or will it just be one or two? And as a result, there's actually less high quality shows. So we played the movie in the conclusion. If it works, and it, it, it'll probably work. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of pressure to make it work. I think we're going to see more original content on Netflix going forward. And there's already, there's already a couple things in the pipeline. There's the um, Arrested Development, which they talked about this morning. Um, the woman that created Weeds got a, a deal with Netflix for an original show. And there's probably going to be more like that. Um, also, 
pretty soon, Amazon, I think Amazon's got a deal in the works, and then YouTube's got some stuff coming as well. So you're gonna see more stuff like this. You're gonna see more choice for consumers, obviously. The question of cord cutting, whether this is gonna really replace, I mean, this is what keeps Comcast up at night, I'm sure, but look at, look at your internet money, but they're, they're worried they won't get your cable money as much. Um, and then what we just talked about, if will this change how HBO and Showtime have to live? And then finally, are the costs, the big question is the economics. Can eight bucks a month sustain this type of television program? It just remains to be seen. So I originally planned for 10 minutes and came talking a little bit, and so I think that I just uh, knocked it out in about seven minutes. <laughs>
is that this one shows you there are actually quite a few companies that we could be focusing on. You know, if we just took one of our case studies and talked about, okay, let's take Disney and let's see how we're finding it on all of these different, um, well, the same device, but um, different websites, different apps, and you'll find a lot of inconsistencies. It's actually challenging research because when you're trying, in research, you're trying to find themes, continuities, and when you do this kind of research, you find a lot of discontinuities, and then how do you say anything concrete? So that was what kept us up at night. Um, so in this chapter, we offer two case studies of Time Warner and Disney um, and how they have responded to Apple's ambitious efforts to build a consumer electronics ecosystem. And I should tell you, I, I, you can sort of see I adapted this. I put iTunes in the middle. This picture actually puts Apple TV in the middle, which is a whole other conversation. Uh, but because this is how I want to talk about it, that's why it looks like that. So at the center of this ecosystem is iTunes, because offer, offering content through iTunes usually requires companies to make larger commitments to the wider Apple economy. So they come in, they want to have something available on iTunes, and then they have to have a conversation about everything else here. And of course, Apple doesn't enable Flash, so it causes all kinds of other ripple effects. Um, so to reiterate, the trouble with this research is that we did not find much continuity among conglomerates, or even among divisions within the conglomerates. So instead, the closer we look, the more complex, contradictory, and at times, flat out irrational, that's Elisa, <laughs> the contemporary landscape for licensing Hollywood content appears. All right, so I'm just going to freestyle it a little bit, and if I have time, I might read our conclusion, just give you kind of the questions that remain. Um, so Elisa focused on Disney, and um, what try to historicize it a little bit, she looked, started with Michael Eisner, and he had the reputation for having very firm control over his content. So in the early 2000s, we find that um, there was some there was some experimentation with film, uh, full length film, on some websites. Um, but generally, the broadband diffusion was relatively limited at the time, and these websites weren't exactly user friendly. So this was just kind of toe toe in the water. Um, now, when Robert Iger took over in 2005, we actually see a radical shift. Um, his, his he immediately wanted to mend fences with Steve Jobs, which had been that relationship was very badly damaged under Eisner. Pixar had gone and looked for other distribution partners. It was pretty crazy at the time. So Robert Iger um, became, you know, a restored relationship with Steve Jobs, eventually actually bought Pixar, which is when Jobs became the largest shareholder in Disney. Um, and so you kind of see, I hate to use the word synergy because it's out of vogue and really ineffective, but to a certain extent, this story in some ways is about attempts at um, synergy between the two. So she has other examples, but one of them is that Apple announces the iPod in the same year we find out that Disney ABC is not going to distribute its shows on iTunes. So we can kind of see that these two are, you know, helping each other out. Um, one point, there's always a qualification, and one qualification that Lisa makes when she talks about, in particular, Disney and ABC. We're talking about Lost right now. We're talking about highly serialized fantasy mythological storytelling where if you miss an episode, you might be out. So there was a real imperative for ABC to make their content available. So you compare that to a CBS which is not the serialized, which is standalones. You know, you find that they actually do not experiment as much in the digital realm, largely because of audience and age and types of, types of programming. Similarly with Disney, um, Disney's a cable channel, so you have a little bit different economics, but the Disney channel is aimed at kids, first who grow up quickly, till you have stars who grow up or get drunk and show up naked on the internet, so they tend to be flash, <laughs> flash excitement, and then it dissipates. So Disney wasn't quite as afraid putting their content online, because they were trying to get the people while they were there, see it, maybe get a cable subscription, things like that. Time Warner is kind of the flip side of the whole thing, and this is basically an ex uh, exploration of rhetoric versus reality. Um, so Jeff Bukas became CEO in 2008, so that's really where I start, and as I note here, um, one of his first big actions was to sell Time Warner Cable and to sell AOL. Certainly, AOL much bigger story should be its own chapter. Own book, maybe two. Um, but what I want to focus on is the fact that he has made the decision to sell their distribution arms. And so this remarks a shift to focusing on content. They are con Time Warner is a content producer. And in fact, Hollywood Reporter re reported that 80% um, of their revenue comes from television content. So it's a really big part of, of their business. So we have Jeff Buke is uh, introducing TV everywhere in this Wall Street Journal editorial, which is really interesting to read. Um, he talks about the golden age of TV, and it's very rah, rah, rah TV. Um, but uh, you know, as a TV studies person, you have to be a little critical. 
But he, you know, you can say he really popularized TV everywhere. It's since been adopted by a lot of other companies. Comcast version is Xfinity. Um, and so everyone's kind of doing it a little bit differently. But um, he kind of set up the ideology. And he frames it as incumbent, like Time Warner, versus new entrants, like Netflix, like Apple. And he's very strong about they are not distributors. And it sounds weird when you think about, well, iTunes is where I go. That's where they give me the content. But I, they, they distribute it to me. Um, but he's talking about traditional business models dual revenue stream, windowing practices. So when he makes these distinctions, they're historical, they're industrial. And he very much wants technology to be harnessed to advance current business models of television distribution. So when you hear him talking all friendly about Netflix, because yes, he did the Albanian army, and then later on he said, but wait, remember the Ottomans? They took over Asia. So he's kind of, <laughs> he tends to be, I mean, Netflix certainly talks about HBO pretty rough, but he tries to be a little more, uh, sort of friendly. Um, he's happy to work with Netflix as long as Netflix works along his terms. So um, one of my case studies was HBO Go, um, which uh, HBO in general is nice for this kind of thing because they are known for experimenting with technologies. It's this image down here shows they were the first to, first to go to multitasking on demand. HBO was the first big pusher into on demand. Uh, so they're known for technological innovation. We have some keywords here, access, retention, and control. So access and control, you see there seems to be tension, and there is. Um, but in particular, they have a, a privileged clientele. They have to pay extra, not just cable, obviously pay for HBO as well. So they actually really want access available to these customers because they're trying to justify the extra expense. So the, it's really imperative for them to make HBO available cross platform. So that's the theory. Um, and they went, but again, always on their terms. So the iTunes Sopranos deal, uh, there was actually a history of um, Apple was trying to sell all TV brands at 99 cents. That's what they wanted. They wanted it to be nice and easy, consumer friendly. Uh, NBC once bought, took all their content offline, and iTunes said, all right, see ya. It, nothing, right? So uh, HBO comes in and says, okay, we will be happy to share some of our content, but at 199 or 299, you make the decision. And they said, okay. So they have power to actually set different kinds of terms. But again, everything is trying to kind of reinforce these current business models. Um, so we find that there's all kinds of discontinuities here with HBO Go. Certainly in the beginning, maybe remaining, there's still challenges of authentication. How do you actually confirm that these people are subscribers? Um, it just actually, HBO Go just, I think this week, is now on the Xbox. And yeah. so all the gamers are like, woohoo! And then they're like, oh, you have to subscribe? <laughs> So it's there, but only if you are within the little gates of the HBO community. Um, and so individual deals with distribution companies, in particular, I want to emphasize long-standing partnerships. And so when you look at certain deals that are made, it's always useful to look at have they been in business together for a long time? Is that part of why we might see some of these deals being made? Because again, trying to maintain industry structures is a big part of it is relationships. Um, and Netflix in particular, again, could be a much bigger topic. Um, but they, HBO Go is, not very friendly towards Netflix. Um, and Netflix isn't necessarily going to respond to them in the way that's going to reinforce their business models. So we see a lot of tension here. And um, Kessler, the president of HBO's line, is there's value in exclusivity. So they have a real priority uh, effort here to maintain the sense of only a few people can get access to this. Um, okay, so this study, I just tried to kind of get a few like bullet points for things to think about. So, because our argument would be, that it's very difficult to come up here and say, here is the answer on digital distribution. In fact, we're just raising a bunch of questions. So when you want to go and explore this further, things you think people should think about is, think about business models and structures, whether you're talking about an incumbent or a new entrant. You need to think about where they're making their money, um, what long-standing traditions are in place that um, reinforce that windowing is something that the industry is going to hold on to long and hard. Um, their relationships, historic and contemporary, with distributors and producers. Um, the deals they make with individual divisions, you actually can't just talk about Time Warner. You know, we just talked, I just talked about HBO today. If I go to Turner, that's an entirely different, you know, that, but then we get, does TNT and TBS make, make different choices based on the comedy versus drama, those kinds of things. Um, so you have to actually look for those kind of, you, have to, you know, look, look within the Kung Bong. Um, content type and audience, so as I talked about before, serial, drama versus standalone episodes. Technological capabilities, certainly technology is an off-sited limitation. Um, the reality of that, like the scarcity, we can debate. Um, but as I pretty much argue in here, 
Um, policy usually trumps technology in, in, in these instances. What we see is that there are policies, ideologies in place that are being upheld that are actually what kind of determine what kinds of content you can access on your phone based on your, your you know, cable membership, et cetera. Do I have a couple of minutes to just read the conclusion? Okay. So the relative mobility of video content may be a popular topic among scholars, journalists, and tech bloggers, but it may not be a true trend with consumers, at least not yet. Two studies, one by a mobile traffic management firm and one by Nielsen, reported that only 10% of owners of mobile devices were responsible for 90% of traffic. We are therefore mainly discussing early adopters, who often have particular habits that differ substantively from the broader media audience. As Max Dawson argues in his examination of the digital television transition, industry and scholarly attention to early adopters, those who most quickly embrace new media technologies, have not only created a distorted sense of a digital divide, but also have contributed to a research deficit. It is important to recognize that companies like Disney and Time Warner seem to be acting more in anticipation, or fear, of the future than in response to contemporary consumption practices. To wit, today is the beginning of the end of TV as we know it, and the future will only favor those who prepare now, reads a report prepared by IBM Business Consulting Services in 2006 for senior business executives in the media industries. Content producers are being proactive in a way the music industry does not in the interest of having greater control over their destiny. Despite conglomerate efforts to control the distribution of mobile content, the future remains uncertain. People may not adopt these technologies, uh, these devices. Uh, adoption may be very slow, or change may happen in ways unanticipated. What is certain, however, is that the current landscape of digital media distribution is one of confusion and chaos. Some shows are available on multiple digital platforms, while others cannot be found anywhere. This chaos and confusion can also be felt at the level of consumption, particularly for those who are not technologically savvy. A challenge for research about Apple and its devices is, is the flurry of reporting that arrives with each large-scale Apple announcement. Over the last decade, the mainstream press has sustained a love affair with Apple, whereas major announcements by other technology companies such as Amazon and Microsoft are often buried in the technology pages of newspapers, if they're covered at all. Every move that Apple makes generates thousands of words in print and pixels. So as a researcher, you're just overwhelmed. This voluminous coverage certainly makes it easier for researchers to track Apple's every move and follow its shifting relationships with Hollywood conglomerates. However, at the same time, such coverage makes it even more difficult for researchers to make conclusive statements about digital distribution practices and challenges. Throughout all of this reporting, however, one point remains, uh, does remain consistent. The ability to sell devices depends on the availability of media content. By extension, a device without enough content will not revolutionize any consumer's development, television habits, or industry's fundamental operations. This is our danger. So there's a book on the Apple book saying Apple needs the content producers. When Apple launched the second incarnation of its Apple TV, a lighter, cheaper, and more versatile streaming-only system, sales remained low. Many media analysts sur surmised that this was due in part to a lack of available Hollywood content. As Holman W. Jenkins Jr. contends in the Wall Street Journal, what we want is to watch anything we want, wherever we want, for a single monthly price. This desire, though understandable, fails to account for the decades-old infrastructure, business models, corporate practices, and cultural attitudes that support and sustain the television industry. As just one notable example, syndication dollars continue to provide much of the revenue that offsets the cost of producing multi-million dollar episode programs. Companies are reticent to push online distribution efforts too far for fear that they jeopardize the income generated through this revenue stream. The future of television remains unclear, to be sure. However, by understanding the issues that underlie conglomerate decision-making, Scholars, consumers, and activists are better able to demand not only more diverse content, but perhaps even more open platforms. Okay, we've got a lot of time for discussion, so could the panelists come join me up here? We'll, uh, we'll see if there's some questions out there. No comments.
it'll go on um, it'll go on Netflix indefinitely, immediately, and I think that I assume that Netflix, you know, where it has overseas operations, which I think like it just just in Latin America and, and a few, I think parts of Europe. Um, I think it'll be available there, but I don't. Short answer is I don't really. No, uh, but my interest is actually more in the countries where it doesn't have operations. You know, this idea that perhaps they might be going to recoup a significant amount of that budget by well, when I say significant, I mean that's it's a huge budget, obviously, but by selling to to other countries where it's going to air as highly premium content in the way it might have aired right. on on HBO or something like that. See, I. I mean, in a traditional deal, the studio, you know, the studio would retain those rights, yeah. and so, you know, Media Rights Capital, which is the studio that, that developed the project, um, you know, Netflix would play the role of NBC, and then they could, you know, Media Rights Capital could then later go sell it to TNT. Um, I mean, we don't know the specifics. I sort of, I, I would sort of assume that that would be part of the deal. Like, I mean, Net, Netflix probably isn't going to go into the content sales. You know, business, or, or, or maybe they want to. We just don't know. It's a really good question. Netflix is, I mean, they've had a rough year. Um, so all of everything we talked about Netflix has been transformed by some of these missteps and other things. So I, I consider them a real wild card right now. I mean, the most recent press is, oh, Netflix now wants to be like a cable channel. So instead of seeing innovation and transformation, we're seeing them actually just become, as Fuchs wants, becoming part of the established business models of, of distribution. They'll actually partner with cable companies like Comcast, and we'll actually see them showing up there. So I, I'm not sure yet um, that they're doing that much that's transformative. But. If I could just, sorry, just follow up that with one just last question about that. Do you think that by virtue of being on Netflix and therefore indefinitely available, that that also hurts in terms of the lack of aftermarket sales? The fact that you know, you're not going to probably buy a Blu-ray version of House of Cards if you feel that it's always going to be there in the cloud Right, absolutely, and there's not going to be a market for syndication either, because why would you watch it on right. TNT with commercials when you... But not everyone subscribes to Netflix, and yeah. also the video sales have been falling. I think it's actually a good bet for Netflix, because, you know, they're losing stars. They need people to keep subscribing. They might not even need the international sales. They might think that audience retention is enough to justify the price. Yeah, I think this is really interesting, because both Windows and residuals are legacy business models. Residuals are based on windowing. Um, and this idea of shelf life that you mentioned, um, when Netflix talks about its long tail strategy, its shelf life is infinite. Um, and the reason they don't care about the, pro the reason that they're uh, packaging the whole, all the episodes at once is because of the binge TV strategy. They don't care about stretching out the viewing over time because they're not intending for the audiences to keep returning to the commercial message because they're based on a subscription system. And so part of what interests me, and all, thank you for such a fabulous panel, by the way. I was so busy taking notes, you all taught me so much. But part of what I'm kind of wondering about is clearly the sort of cultural shift in Hollywood hasn't happened yet in terms of understanding why Netflix is doing this. Is in part, it's moving beyond those legacy business models. Um, but they're doing away with things like residuals and windowing. And that, to me, I think is, um, acknowledging what digital media actually is, which is that it's infinite in some sense of time and space, which windowing and residuals are not. So I'm just wondering if you guys want to comment. Well, the problem is the financials. Uh, there were reports that didn't uh, Netflix offer an awful lot of, um, they, were, they were offering a lot of for sale recently. They were trying to raise a lot of revenue, and so everyone was like, oh, Netflix is overextended. They, and that was part of where the price increase came from, is that they're trying to do all this purchasing but that they actually might be in the hole in like maybe like an Italy or Greece type of way. Mm -hmm. um, we, we aren't kind of aware of all their financials, but they might be in a little bit of trouble. And so part of what we're going to see is can this model that they're trying to create sustain them? Yeah, but also I think Netflix is really just one channel too. Okay. So um, they're challenging some things, but you're right that the studio that's making the show might find a way to still work in all that traditional stuff in other ways by selling it in the I mean, we just don't know that. And as merchandise and reference, I mean, you know, there's t shirts and anything else that might be spin off of, you know, is that part of, where is that? Part of it? I, we don't know. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, yeah, we don't know. Um, so, Augie. Yeah, um, <laughs> what you're saying for the first percent, do you go by AJ? I sometimes do, yeah. Okay, I just noticed that from your email address. I, I was fascinated by your question.
at the end, and because it started me thinking about game theory. And if you have, for example, two entities engaged in profit maximization, the distributor and the producer, you've got one particular game going on. But if you have a distributor that's uh, trying to maximize profit and a producer who just wants to get a message out, you have a different set of exchange. Or if you have content that's created, created just because I love to create content, a different game. There may be some potential there to take and develop what the different motivations are at each level and look at the match or mismatch. Especially, I love the way you tiered you have the different levels of distribution. You have the low, medium, high, that matrix that was implicit in your, your uh, opening slide. But implicit in that matrix was this division uh, between motivations. And trying to match that up might lead to some, uh, I hesitate to do it at a conference that has so many uh, people from the cultural perspective. But you might actually come up with equations that would lead you to a better understanding of which ones are going to succeed and fail. That's really interesting. I'm, I'm not a game theorist, um, and we should talk about equations because I love statistics and math and all that stuff, but I can't do any of it. Um, no, I, but I think you're you're right that the motivations are sometimes different. I mean, what's interesting about the web series market, independent web series, I should say, is that there is a lot of kind of quixotic. I want to make the show that I've always wanted to make, but there is this implicit recognition that because digital distribution is so cheap, you can also make money through that. Um, and it's happening in some spaces. I mean, YouTube is really a case where people are making the kinds of shows that they always wanted to make, and some of them are making six figures doing it. Um, so there's this idea that money and art can come together um, that doesn't always happen. Um, I don't know how that relates to game theory, but I think you're onto something. We should talk after. <laughs> <laughs> next question, next question or back behind the slide. Hi. Um, what my concern scripted stuff, I do the real life documentary stuff, you don't make it. Um, but when you have scripted narrative films and programs like this, and then you have these distribution models, I start thinking about labor and labor costs. And especially with um, you, Leslie, you, 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 um, you represent a union, and there are specific pay rate rules, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for um, the uh, talent and crew that make up uh, t uh, TV and, and, and movie shows. So how does this distribution, all this money being thrown, thrown about, how is that coming down to like the SAG after <coughs> or, or the Teamster worker who, who work on these shows? It's, it's, it's a big question that's out there as, as this transition happens. And I, I, there's actually somebody in the room who's way more qualified to answer this probably than I am. Um, that that I'm, if it's appropriate, can I can I punt a question? <laughs> sure. I can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, the, the short answer is most of the most of the collective bargaining agreements, uh, all of them, before four years ago, didn't have any consideration of these new business. And of course, the argument made by the producers was, well, this is all promotion. We shouldn't have to pay you anything because this is all designed to bring us um, audience to the existing and traditional. And, and so what, this was what the strike was about in 2007, the, the design was to at least set minimums and, and, and in lieu of residuals or a, a form of residuals that would, that would monetize for the talent. Um, the, 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 the same way that, that they're trying to figure out how to monetize it themselves, a way to make a living off this kind of content. And, and you know, you got a company like MRC coming along and throwing $100 million <laughs> in the direction of, of, of Netflix to do one show like that. That's very confusing. And, and yeah. uh, it, that's actually atypical, because the typical situation would be somebody coming along and throwing a really small amount of money and saying, okay, let's let's do this. So so that the hope is that uh, you know we actually encourage MRC because they're an independent producer. There's somebody who's who's not um, uh, who's not trying to cut corners, or at least they're not trying to to make the the the, 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 the product for a uh, for for 
or a, a smaller amount of money, and that leaves, you know, ideally, where does that money go? It goes to the town, it goes to the group. Now, you know, my my question, of course, to, to to Wesley is is when you say, well, this is this is an investment that gets back um, an afternoon of the viewers' time. I mean, do we do we think that that's the, the that Netflix's plan is to just roll these all out at once, or well, is this? That's that's a good. Question. Specifically for House of Cards, they haven't announced it yet, but that is how they rolled out Lilyhammer, and they did it. They did an interview with Sarandos, who's the chief content guy, and he said that's how that's how the viewers want it. That's how we're going to release it. So I mean, they had the opportunity with this, you know, with with Lilyhammer to do that, and they dumped it all out at once. But see, to me, the, the the business model, if it's if it's Netflix trying to become HBO in regards, certainly to this kind of pro property, the, the business model of HBO was. Look, let's let's get a, an exclusive uh, a boxing match or a movie that nobody else has, and we'll get subscribers in for that that thing. And then the human nature is you keep subscribing for months thereafter, and and as a result, that's where Netflix's return on that hundred million dollar investment is. So so the notion that they would just put it out for a, a chunk of time, a limited chunk of time, sort of defeats the purpose of well, then you're gonna you know how are you gonna keep people coming back to Right, and, and especially if you know they're, they're losing some of the, the, the studio content now, so if they're going to be producing more original content, will they be able to keep up with you know a viewer that watches one show in an afternoon? I mean, how many shows will they have to provide to, to keep that viewer engaged? Here's my uh, just my cynical answer is one of the majors buys Netflix, and then that solves everybody's problems because then they don't then they're not going to be making this kind of property. It's not going to be. Uh, they're not going to have this other competitor out there that's going to be a, uh, a thorn in their, in their side. Yeah, yeah, Comca the yeah, Comcast has made an, an announcement that someday, you know, some someday you'll see Netflix will be part of the Comcast package. <laughs> um, I mean, I think they, they said that they want forty percent of the site to be original, something like that. I mean, it's close to fifty, so they want to do a lot more. Um, right. Randy, uh, uh, comment to Bill off of that. Something that is really useful to them is simply to get people in the door. I think they were talking about this specifically in relationship to discounts around Christmas. That for them, one of the things that they've recognized is, is that simply getting someone to subscribe initially leads people to stay subscribed. And in fact, people are so inherently lazy about unsubscribing because of what they're paying for that it doesn't matter if you don't come back in a month because yes, you're still paying eight ninety five or nine ninety five. But it also seems like it would be really interesting you to try if they don't come back in a month. I'm sorry. You kind of hope they don't come back in a month. Yeah. yeah as long as they keep but that's, yeah, that's, that's part that's, of their business model. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But it's, it's also it's also worth thinking about. We're, we're trying to cram this into a sort of traditional entertainment model. What struck me as interesting amongst all of your conversations is that if we think about what Netflix is doing as an R and D investment, it really fundamentally like changes what happens about the, the amount of money they're spending. Because one of the things that they get to do, and, and one of you alluded to it, is they actually now have the ability to gain metrics in a very interesting way about original content that doesn't have to go through the traditional media models. And this may actually give them leverage. And so I've seen in that light, maybe the, maybe the investment isn't quite so ridiculous. But yeah, I mean, they have a different set of concerns. I mean, a slightly different set of concerns than most traditional networks. So you're talking about like understanding what their users' tastes are so they can buy the right content to cater to those users and push the right and just, I mean, just to, to track marketing behavior and, and what happens, you know, whether this brings in new audiences, so what happens, you know, you're, you know, you're putting a big name actor out there, you, you know, splashy information on new, new content with big directors, big investments. Yeah, what I does mean, that draw? The reason then, why again, how do, you know, how do people watch this so they can figure out then how best to target new content later on more cheaply? And they have all the demographic information about their users to mm -hmm. go on that. It has to hit. Let's say House of Cards does nothing. Well, that's why they hired David Fincher, right? It's new and new and wrong. I mean, I think that like the the reason why they're following HBO is that you show, you show the subscriber base for HBO. So people don't cancel. The idea is that it's so culturally relevant that you just you can't. Even if you haven't seen it in a month, David Fincher might do a show, and then you're going to be the one out. Pretty smart. So Nikki.
Um, so in an earlier panel, maybe it was today, someone cited Tim Wu's The Master Switch. Right? And there's this, I mean, it's become a popular book, and it's maybe a little reductive, but it's a seductive idea that all media start from these kind of indie beginnings and then eventually close off to some kind of conglomerate system. Um, and for me, I, I feel like in studying independent web series, which the current moment you can track from like about 2006 to now, this is kind of that moment. Um, and it's still a moment in which we can imagine that there are some small players that will subsist and kind of percolate on the bottom and be successful for years and years to come. I mean, I think if we look at history, that's unlikely to happen, especially since six companies own all the media that we consume. But by studying it now, we can understand whether why that didn't happen. Um, and if it does happen, how we can replicate it further. Because I think that as academics, we want many people, that we want more businesses, we want more producers, we want diversity, we want all these things. Um, and I think, for me, I would view myself as a kind of empiricist, trying to understand uh, why things happen the way they do. So Blip TV is a really great example, because it's YouTube, but it's for a very specialized community, and they do offer higher ad rates, and so there's a, like they can support indie, like people can run their own shows, presumably, and make a living. You know, people you could just be a you could be a TV showrunner the way that you're a teacher. You know, you make sixty thousand dollars a year and you have your show. That's a really interesting idea. It's something we haven't seen before, and it's a different view of television than um, the nineteen seventies and before the kind of theories of TV that we have of like big business, lots of power, and, uh, producers have no agency. I don't know if that's a question, but one of the worst things that we get to deal with is verb tense. How do you write in a contemporary, I mean, Steve Jobs died while this book had gone from like one stage of edits to the next stage of edits, so people had to like, especially if they were really focusing on like his mission, had to radically revise at a late stage for publications like this book had come out this summer. So we wrote everything in the past tense, which was really odd, because we were trying to be as up to date as possible, but we had to think about, you know, the, the long tail of this book and as people are going to it, and that's also why we were so open-ended about it. But, um, I, I, you know, I'm a media historian, so I do have kind of this, this concern that we do find that conglomerates usually do kind of bring them into the fold. You know, if Netflix were to get purchased, I would say, well, of course, you know, I, I would not, that would not surprise me at all, it's probably disappoint me. But the one that really, um, to talk about one of the, the different voices out there that, gets, that got me going was Hulu, which I've always refused to use because it's three conglomerates. <laughs> and they, I mean, the way they branded that and became so well known so fast, that just showed to me, you talked about marketing, and absolutely, like, there is a power that these companies have to get you, and, and most people could not tell you what companies were involved. And most people would be like, why can't I find the Big Bang Theory? Well, it's CBS, that's, you know, but they, they don't make those same connections, and so scholars can make those connections, and because these transformative moments do open up possibilities, and historians are always looking back and saying, oh, it didn't have to happen, it wasn't inevitable, but we're in a moment where we can say, it doesn't have to happen, you know, that um, we should be asking these questions and trying to put these out there, um, blogging and other kinds of things so that these become part of the discourse, the conversation, so that Hulu isn't naturalized, so that we do think about what it means to have these companies all um, put their content out there under their terms. So. And there's nothing wrong with Hulu. I mean, I like Hulu, but, you know, more is better. things are restricted. 
iTunes has started um, offering some content, but each piece of content needs to be individually licensed, right. and therefore there is almost no television on iTunes. And oddly enough, you get big Hollywood films, but New Zealand films aren't even available on New Zealand iTunes because of the strain, you know, the, the vagaries of international licensing and who has the, the right to sell the license to iTunes New Zealand is the US distributor of the New Zealand film.
business strategies and manufacturing processes. I just think that's something that, that was a threat. And I think your presentation, Karen, right, is you uh, emphasize, I think, rightly the, the uh, conservative influence of institutions and that these are pressures that are going to constrain this, a lot of this development. And one last thing, building on what Mickey talked about in terms of the slowness and speed of stuff, a lot of this stuff is not totally new in terms of historical conduct. We've seen challenges to Nielsen in the past, and what happens is Nielsen is compelled to adjust a little bit, and then the competitors drift away because the business wants standardization, they want routinization, that's what allows their processes to flow smoothly, to be lubricated, and to maximize efficiency. And so I think those are some important things just to stir the pot a little bit. No, I really appreciate that because, as I mentioned, anyone but me, it's really one of these wonderful shows. It's like this beautiful little drama about these two young girls. And, you know, they have a big audience, but I think the problem is they go to advertisers and they're like, we have 100,000 you know, people following, and they're like, we don't trust you. Those numbers are from Blip. We did not Nielsen rated, you know. So there is a kind of glue and kind of gel to the industry that makes it run um, that a lot of people just don't have access to. Um, and I don't see that changing because it, you know, it would be too much. Maybe it'd be too much to ask Nielsen to rate every single show that ever comes online. I mean, they have a very specific way, specific way of doing things. It's very expensive. I don't know. How to get out of it. There's two things that are important about that. One is that for the the national marketers, they want multiple million people and they're quite upfront about this. They, they don't, which is like a, such an antiquated way of thinking about stuff, but they're locked into these legacy workflows. So that, that's one important thing. Um, the second has to do with the efficiency of having different ratings agencies. It's very expensive if you have to pay multiple times for the same product. Phil Napoli's work on this is very illuminating. The audience, that because we know that this is a fabricated product and not a real thing, I mean, why pay two different companies for something as long as you can find an agreeable thing? That's what the, the competition comes, is trying to find consistency among the buyers and sellers on what they judge to be reliable and so forth. Well, they both have to agree. Right, that's what I mean, yeah. We've had a lot of panels on advertisers and apps, so really we should. Uh, they are a huge player in all of this, but we kind of get lost in the content sometimes. We forget about the people that are actually paying for the, the, the content. You know, it's the advertisers and what they, they have to buy the narrative of Actually, a lot of push people online, and it might end up being that this kind of chaos maintains. 